What to do about the strained U.S.-Pakistan relationship? Akif Ahmad of the Convergence Center for Policy Studies has some answers. He'll discuss them next on Global Perspectives. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia. Welcome to Global Perspectives. Over the years, the U.S.-Pakistan relationship has emphasized security and often involved government and military figures. Akif Ahmad of the Convergence Center for Policy Resolution is striving to broaden the conversation. Welcome to the show, Mr. Ahmad. Thank you, John. Nice to be here. Tell us about the center. What is the nature of it? How did it start? Convergence uh, Center for Policy Resolution started uh, in 2009, and it was the brainchild of a gentleman named Robert Fersh, who believed that in Washington, there were very few safe spaces for people who disagreed to sit down and talk together in a different way, where they could actually begin to build trust and relationship and focus less on winning the debate and more on trying to problem solve. And so we've applied that in both a domestic context and an international context. What do you say to the, to the critics of that approach who would emphasize that security really should be the focus, and if we don't fix what's happening today, there might not be any long term? No, I think, I think we agree with that. Security is a very important focus in this relationship, and Pakistan is struggling within its own borders around how to provide a peaceful environment uh, for its own citizens and to be a responsible country within the region. And they have a set of interests which they're focused on, and so do we here in the United States, and those always don't align, and that's the struggle. Our focus is that over time, if you broaden the conversation in to include security concerns, but also trade and investment, also people-to-people -people relationships, also around how we begin to work together as an established democracy with an emerging democracy, that over time, those other conversations and investments begin to positively affect the alignment between our security interests and theirs. Can we step back and maybe take a look at Pakistan, sure. where it is economically, politically? Some people call it a, a, a fragile democracy. Some people think it's a state that's on the verge of sure. uh, failing, et cetera, et cetera. And, and its population is surging. So we're talking about a country that's moving up the population yeah. charts. Yeah, Pakistan is interesting. It's, you know, it's this, geographically it's the size of Oklahoma and Texas. And within that, you have almost 200 million people smooched together. Um, they're very diverse. Uh, there's lots of languages, lots of ethnic groups. Uh, a variety of religious communities exist within there. And they're struggling as a country in how to recognize those differences and use them to their advantage, not to their disadvantage. Pakistan's been around now for 65 years as a country. Uh, it's had a mix of elected governments and military governments, some setbacks, but always trying to find its way back to an elected uh, situation. Its economy has struggled. It's had periods of growth and periods of contraction. But when you look at it, it's got an enormous amount of potential. You know, I got, I've gotten to know a number of American companies who've worked in Pakistan, including Procter & Gamble and PepsiCo and others, and they're doing great. Procter & Gamble is about to build its third factory in Pakistan. It's one of the fastest growing businesses for the company in Asia. And they would love to see other American companies begin to invest, but it's a struggling environment. It feels unsafe. It feels uncertain. And that's the dilemma Pakistan faces, is how, do, how does Pakistan as a country present an image of itself as a place of opportunity, not as a place of fear? How do you convince people of that when so much of what we hear on TV, sure. uh, read in the news, uh, suggests a country that is very unstable. It is. It, it, it does come across that way. And I, you know, when I first began this work, I grew up in the U.S. I was born in Chicago. Um, I was worried about going to Pakistan, and the headlines would suggest it's not a safe place to be. But when I went and I began to meet the people in Karachi and Lahore and Islamabad, and I began to travel uh, and visit places and and folks doing good work on the ground. So many stories began to emerge that affected my view of what was really going on. I met uh, a young uh, a driver uh, who drove a Hertz rental car for 10 years. His name was Muzhar. And he and I chatted for the better part of a day, driving me around different appointments in Karachi. His proudest achievement at that point in his life was that he'd moved his family 
to a one-bedroom place with a fan after, 10 and a half, after almost 15 years of working. And his proudest achievement beyond that was that both of his girls were going to school. He'd worked really hard to make sure they were going to get a good education. And he told me that he hoped that once they graduated, they would one day teach their father how to read, because he never learned to. He had to leave school at age six. He had to start working and support his parents. When you look at that kind of individual and what he's trying to do, and if that's true for not just Muzhar, but for millions of Pakistanis around the country, you realize there's potential. You realize there's aspiration. You realize there's a country of entrepreneurs who are trying to figure their way, way out through. And I think that's what we have to tap into, is that work ethic, that focus on trying to get ahead, doing something that makes your family better off than you were at your stage in life. And our work is attempting to make those connections between people so that that side of Pakistan becomes visible and the comparable side about American society becomes visible to them. And those are the stories we typically don't hear because don't hear. they don't you know, suggest exciting headlines. Sure, they don't. It's, 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 you know, there, was a, there was a reporter from the New York Times, I think, who was visiting Pakistan. And as he was sitting and having coffee, there was a, young, a man who came up to him and said, you know, I, you know, I couldn't find work today. If I, could bar, if I could have some money, I can go get a cup of coffee and some food. And he gave him a, a 500 rupees, I think. And he watched him go into the cafe, and he came out with a cup of coffee and some change. And he watched him put change into a bucket. And that surprised him, because here's a man who didn't have much. He had as much money as this gentleman gave him, and he gave it away. And so he approached him and asked him, why'd you do that? He said, well, here we take care of a man named Edie. Well, he asked, who's Edie? See, Edie's the man who takes care of the children. Well, Edie is a humanitarian of Pakistan who has built an orphanage and an ambulance service um, and a health care service to support the poor. And millions of people are positively affected by what he's done. In fact, there's cots around the country that ask families who can't afford to raise their kids to just leave them there, and they'll take care of them. And so this gentleman believed that even though he had enough to drink that day in terms of a coffee and a sandwich, that the rest of what he had should go to Edie, because Edie takes care of the poor. That is the aspect of this culture that really affected me in my travels and visiting Pakistan, that there is this sense of caring for your other, for your, for your brother and your sister. There's a sense of we can, despite all the challenges, build this country. And as we know from our own history in America, it's hard to build a country from scratch. Um, I often liken Pakistan as a democracy where we were in 1885 struggling with similar issues, similar sets of challenges. And if the Pakistanis can convey that story, if the Pakistanis can articulate those views to hear us in America, I think we will relate to that. I think it's based on those relationships one can begin to think of this just not as a place where we should be afraid of them, but a place where we might be able to invest and get to know them better and want them to get to know us better. But it's a hard task. Because the headlines would suggest this is not a friend. The headlines would suggest this is not a country we can do business with. The headlines would suggest that we shouldn't even be there because it's not safe for us. And that's understandable. Or the headlines might suggest that you have all of these people with good intentions, but you have so many others who don't, mm -hmm. who are inclined toward political violence or something else. And is it worth making the investment in, in the people who want a stable, productive future if it's going to be undermined by these others who don't want that. Sure, and that's, a, that's an important question for us to answer. Um, we do have a strategic interest in this part of the world. We know that as we leave Afghanistan after more than 10 years of war um, and all the burdens that we have confronted because of that time spent, that Pakistan becomes a more important player in the region and that our relationship with Pakistan will in part inform how they conduct their own foreign policy in the region. So in the short term, this relationship needs to improve for the security of the region and for the opportunity of that region to begin to grow. Pakistan needs to be a responsible country on its eastern border and on its western border. And in both instances, that's important to us. For us to be a partner with them, for us to be perceived as an ally from their perspective, and for them to be perceived by us as an ally 
if it's only focused on the security part of the conversation, it will be difficult. It'll be difficult because national interests simply don't always align. And, but if we also recognize that Pakistan is a country of 200 million people, um, 120 million of which are the size, uh, age of our children, our grandchildren, whose concerns are more about what kind of education they can get, uh, whether they can get a job, whether they can raise a family, whether the price of milk and meat is going to come down, what they can buy over time. If we tap into that energy and begin to build a set of investments that put our best foot forward, which is our businesses and our NGOs and our entrepreneurs, and that allows them to put their best foot forward, which is also their businesses and their NGOs and their entrepreneurs, then all of a sudden, we begin to have a stake in each other's future. And when you begin to have a stake in each other's future and in the success, that changes the way you look at security. It changes the way you look at how we deal with these issues. Um, they don't become the only issue you care about. They become something you have to settle so that the rest of the relationship can grow. You know, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, we in China had a very poor relationship. So any single crisis dominated the conversation between the two countries. But now, there's so much business that we do, there's so many other ties that we have, that when a crisis emerges, the, the focus is to settle the crisis, mm -hmm. not to let it dominate the conversation. With Pakistan, we don't have those same ties and that tissue that allows us to have resilience in the face of crisis, that absorbs the shocks and allows the broader, con the broader relationship to continue to move forward. It's an important country for us. For them, we are an important country to them. It's, we are our, their single biggest external trading partner. Um, we have been, over time, uh, a number of American companies have built very successful R&D centers in Pakistan. There's a lot of folks, young, talented people there who are making apps uh, uh, for the iPhone and Android. And that energy is there for us to tap into. That energy is there, and they want it. Now, there's a story I'd like to share about um, how they see us. You know, when you first talk to Pakistanis, some of them will say that the source of their problems is America. And as you look at the polling, you know, America ranks very low in the Pakistani mindset, um, 11, 12 percent approval ratings. And that's hard for us. And it suggests to us that, you know, is this a place we want to work? Is this a place we want to do business? But you can get underneath that conversation very quickly. There was um, a gentleman who, uh, uh, who was working on a number of interfaith programs in Pakistan. And he had uh, put together a group where there was a Pakistani imam, very conservative, and an Orthodox Jewish rabbi in the same room. And the Pakistani imam was very apprehensive about the, this meeting. He'd never met a Jewish person before in his life. And he carried every stereotype you could imagine walking into that. In fact, he was not going to come. But some intermediaries had helped settle down and explain to him and to everyone else, this is going to be an opportunity, to, a safe space to build relationship. Well, the first night of their four-day event, they ended up in the same car going to dinner. And they started talking to each other. They both spoke English, obviously. Uh, they talked about family, about kids, about food, about cooking. And you couldn't separate them for the next three days. And they sat together and they got to know each other. And on the fourth morning at breakfast, the imam had brought his wife to join them for the breakfast. And he stood up and he said, and he turned to the rabbi and he said, you have mentored me like a father. And he invited the rabbi over and said, I would invite you, I would ask you to give a prayer in your language for my son who will be born in four months. His wife was pregnant. And so the rabbi offered that. And it was a stunning moment, because this is a gentleman who four days earlier didn't want to come. And that happens over and over and over again when you bring people together, when they can get away from the headlines and the stereotypes. They begin to sit and talk and get to know one another. And that's the opportunity in this relationship. It's what we've learned after five years of work in Pakistan, that social capital is as important as financial capital. And the time you spend together is even more valued in terms of trying to find ways to create new relationships and move forward in the conversation. 
And so our work is about that. There seems to be an echo at the international level be working between the United States and, and Pakistan on this multi-part um, strategic dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, and is that real? Is it sincere? Has it achieved what you think the two governments hope to achieve? Yeah. Or are they just reaching for things that they might achieve in the future? I think it's sincere. I think it's been, it's been underway now for several years. Uh, it's been in fits and starts because the relationship has been in fits and starts. But there's been a genuine commitment, as we have observed, between both governments to create structured opportunities for leadership in both countries to focus on the issues they can work on together, both in terms of security and defense cooperation, but also in terms of expanding economic cooperation, cooperation in fields like education and health, uh, science and technology. And all of this work is slow, right? The, the complexities around going from concept to idea to investment to action takes time. And within Pakistan, the, uh, even they will share is, we're not well set up to execute. It's hard to go from a federal to a state to a local uh, implementation of major projects. And so uh, as long as that dialogue continues, as long as it can withstand the gyrations of a political crisis or another, as long as it can withstand the gyrations of one political leadership moving on through an elected process from another, I think it has potential. It has certainly signaled to individuals in both countries that there is a set of issues to focus on and that there is, over time, a longer term interest in this relationship. It has its skeptics. It has folks who are unclear what the outputs are. It has folks saying whether or not um, it is more for show than it is for substance. But that's OK, because at this time in the US-Pakistan relationship, institutions of government and outside of government have to put stakes in the ground mm -hmm. around cooperation and collaboration. And no, it's not going to be easy to pursue. What are the main regional issues for Pakistan? Pakistan lives in a tough neighborhood. Tough neighborhood. And, and it's surrounded by big countries, troubled countries, uh, and I'm thinking in particular about India in the big country category and Afghanistan in the troubled country category. Um, how important is resolving those issues to Pakistan's future? I think it's incredibly important. I think they think it's incredibly important. I think the region thinks it's incredibly important. I think the challenge is there's a lot of history, a lot of hurt feelings, a lot of damage that's been done by choices made in the past that have affected the lives of real people in negative ways. And it's not always clear that in the region, the interests of each country are aligned to the others. And whether they're working at cross purposes indefinitely or if there's opportunity to find common ground. Sometimes that changes as leadership changes. Sometimes that changes as generations come into power who may not have carried the same negative realities from their predecessors. And so I think over time, the interests that we hope will take root and dominate are the economic ones, about opportunity, about growth, about investment, and about trade. It is the, one of the largest regions of the world where the gap between what really is going on in terms of trade and investment and what could go on is incredibly wide. And it's because the challenges around sectarianism, around ethnic differences, around terrorism and violence have dominated. But what we see and what we are getting signs of is that the relationship between Afghanistan and Pakistan is beginning to improve. The relationship between the leadership of the two countries is beginning to improve. And that there is some promise that in dealing with the violence that is the endemic nature of their border, um, that they are now beginning to see each other as two countries that can cooperate as opposed to two countries that need to be at adversarial positions. Whether that continues remains to be seen. But it's certainly, we hope, a possibility. And the early signs are, as of these two new administrations, positive. The India-Pakistan relationship is very challenging. Um, it's got a long history of, of complexity and difficulty, uh, of missed expectations and misunderstandings, of bad decisions and bad judgment. And all of that's part of any set of conversations that continue at this point. You have the issue of Kashmir, uh, which is unresolved. You have the issues of, um, of, of real and perceived threats uh, that each country deals with respect to the other. 
you have enormous amounts of expense being spent on defense and military on either side. And yet, you have underneath that business communities who are interested in working together, uh, NGO communities interested in working together, uh, people interested in getting reconnected uh, with each other. Um, at some point, those interests have to surface and begin to provide an alternative narrative and an alternative path uh, that the two countries' political establishments can follow. And again, where the trust can begin to grow and the confidence is around economics and trade, in my opinion. And I think that's where we have to focus. Talking about economics, at a recent White House conference on terrorism, there was a lot of discussion about the fix that can be provided by economic opportunity, which drew a lot of criticism from, from skeptics. Sure. Where do you land in, in that conversation? Is it, is it a part of the solution, or is it far-fetched to suggest that this might be? I don't, there's no panacea to the issues of extremism and violence. It's, it's a, it, it got to this point in a very complex, complex way. It'll take multiple sets of solutions to get us out of it. Um, but it is a part. Um, there are lots of folks within Pakistan who have a hard time finding work, who have a hard time finding a path out of situations that they struggle with in terms of taking care of their families, in terms of having families, in terms of seeing a brighter future than the one they currently struggle in. Uh, and they don't see necessarily the systems or the, 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 the government as the answer. They don't see uh, their own security improving with what's available to them. And so they look for other answers and other solutions. And sometimes that leads them to violence. Will economic opportunity change the nature of extremism in Pakistan? Partly, partly. Um, but it's not the only answer. Uh, there's an underlying ideology that needs to be addressed. There's a, a, a change in the education system within Pakistan that needs to happen. Uh, there are um, conflicts among ethnic groups that need to be resolved. There is a justice system that has to start working for people. Um, those issues have to be addressed by Pakistan for the Pakistanis. Mm -hmm. um, but would it help if there was more opportunity for more people? Absolutely. Talk to us about the nuclear issue. Uh, opportunity, obstacle, how, how do you categorize it? You know, it's, it's, it's not one I'm an expert in. It's a, it's a difficult issue uh, in the region. Um, obviously, from our perspective, we would not want an arms race within South Asia, uh, which is happening. Um, we are very concerned that some of this material may land in the hands of bad people who want to do bad things. And so making sure that doesn't happen is one of the urgent priorities for us as a country in terms of this relationship. I think, again, when people are afraid of each other, they do things that protect themselves. They, do think, they make choices that they think they need to make to lower that sense of fear. But when people begin to realize that the other side can be a partner and a source of strength and a source of opportunity, then the things you do to protect yourself begin to feel a little less important. And the things you do to advance cooperation become more important. And that's where the conundrum is between India and Pakistan, is right now it's about fear and it's about protection. But if we can open up the space for economic opportunity, for trade, for cultural exchange, for more of both societies beginning to invest in the overall growth of that region, well then I think that'll have a positive impact on the choices you make around the things you do when you're afraid. Great, well thank you so much for joining us today, Mr. Ahmad. Thank you. And thank you. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia, and we'll see you next time.